Hello friends and welcome to my channel. In this video we will be learning about the anatomy of the esophagus. To begin with, the esophagus is a narrow muscular tube forming the foot passage between the pharynx and the stomach. Now this is a simple diagram to learn about the extent of the esophagus. It extends from the lower part of the neck to the upper part of the abdomen. Now it begins in the neck at the lower border of the cricoid cartilage. You can see that this is the cricoid cartilage. This diagram shows the lateral view of the esophagus. This is the vertebral column. This is the cricoid cartilage. So the esophagus begins in the neck at the lower border of the cricoid cartilage. It descends in front of the vertebral column through the superior and posterior parts of the mediastinum. It pierces the diaphragm at the level of the 10th thoracic vertebrae as you can see right here. The red color symbolizes the diaphragm in this diagram. It ends by opening into the stomach that is the cardiac end at the level of T11 vertebrae and the length of the esophagus is 25 centimeters. Now the tube is flattened anteroposteriorly as you can see right here. This is the anterior aspect, this is the posterior aspect, this is the superior view, this is the lumen of the esophagus and it is flattened anteroposteriorly. It dilates only during the passage of foot bolus. Emphasizing the important points under the introduction to the esophagus, it is a narrow muscular tube forming the foot passage between the pharynx and the stomach. It extends from the lower part of the neck to the upper part of the abdomen. It begins in the neck at the lower border of the cricoid cartilage. It descends in front of the vertebral column through the superior and posterior parts of the mediastinum. It pierces the diaphragm at the level of 10 thoracic vertebra and ends by opening into the stomach that is the cardiac end at the level of the T11 vertebra. Its length is 25 cm and the tube is flattened anteroposteriorly and the lumen is kept collapsed. It dilates only during the passage of foot bolus. Now let's look at the curvatures of the esophagus. Now this diagram shows the anterior view. And generally the esophagus is vertical but displays two shallow curves both of which are towards the left. Now starting in the median plane it inclines to the left as far as the root of the neck and gradually it returns to the median plane near the fifth thoracic vertebra as you can see right here. Then it deviates leftwards again at the seventh thoracic vertebra before it pierces the diaphragm right here. Now this diagram shows the lateral view of the esophagus and it shows the anteroposterior curvatures which correspond to the curvatures of the cervical thoracic spine. This is the anterior aspect, this is the posterior aspect, here is the cervical curvature and here is the thoracic curvature and the esophagus is curvatured accordingly. Now concising the important points under the curvatures of the esophagus, the esophagus is vertical but shows two shallow curvatures. There are two side to side curvatures both towards the left side. One is at the root of the neck and other near the lower end. Now the anteroposterior curvatures correspond to the curvatures of the cervical thoracic spine. Now let's learn about the constrictions of the esophagus. Normally the esophagus shows four constrictions. First is 6 inches from the incisor teeth where it is crossed by the cricopharyngeus muscle right here. Now the second constriction is 9 inches from the incisor teeth where it is crossed by the arch of the iota as you can see right here. Third constriction is 11 inches from the incisor teeth where it is crossed by the left bronchus. And finally the fourth constriction is 15 inches from the incisor teeth where it pierces the diaphragm. Now the distance from the incisor teeth are important in passing instruments like the endoscope into the esophagus. Now concising the important points under the constrictions of the esophagus, normally the esophagus shows four constrictions. These are seen as indentations. At its beginning, it is 6 inches from the incisor teeth where it is crossed by the cricopharyngeus muscle. Second constriction is where it is crossed by the aortic arch. It is 9 inches from the incisor teeth. Third constriction where it is con uh, crossed by the left bronchus. 11 inches from the incisor teeth. And finally, 15 inches from the incisor teeth where it pierces the diaphragm. Now, the distance from the incisor teeth are important in passing instruments like endoscope into the esophagus. Now, let's learn about the relations of the cervical part of the esophagus. Here, I've drawn a diagram that shows a cross-sectional superior view of the cervical esophagus as well as its relations so that we can learn it in an easier manner. 
Firstly, looking at the anterior relations, we can see the trachea as well as the right and left recurrent laryngeal nerves right here. Posteriorly, we can see the longest coli muscle in red as well as the vertebral column. On each side, the cervical esophagus is related to the corresponding lobe of the thyroid gland as well as the thoracic duct on the left side. Now here I have drawn a diagram of the cross-sectional view of the thoracic part of the esophagus and its relations. So we look at the anterior relations. There is a trachea, the right pulmonary artery, the left bronchus, the pericardium with the left atrium as well as the diaphragm represented in a black line right here. Now posteriorly we can see the vertebral column, the right posterior intercostal artery, the thoracic duct the azygos vein in blue, the thoracic aorta as well as the diaphragm which is a common relation to both the anterior and posterior aspect of the thoracic part of the esophagus. Now looking at the relations to the right of the thoracic part of the esophagus, we have the right lung and pleura, the right vagus nerve and the azygos vein which is a common relation to both the posterior as well as right side of the thoracic part of the esophagus. Moving on to the relations to the left of the thoracic part of the esophagus, we can divide it into two that is relations in the superior mediastinum as well as relations in the posterior mediastinum. First let us look at the relations in the superior mediastinum. We have the aortic arch, the left subclavian, the thoracic duct, the left lung and pleura as well as the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. Now looking at the relations in the posterior mediastinum. We have the descending thoracic aorta, the left lung and the mediastinal pleura. Now, For those who find it difficult to remember the relations of the thoracic part of the esophagus through this diagram, you can remember these words corresponding to the relations that is for the anterior relations we have B, P, P, A, T, D that is B stands for the left bronchus, P for the pericardium, P, A for the right pulmonary artery, T for the trachea and D for the diaphragm. For the posterior relations we have D, V, T, T that is D stands for the diaphragm, I for the right posterior intercostal artery, V for the vertebral column, A for the azygos vein, T for the thoracic duct and T for the thoracic aorta. Looking at the right relations, we have LAVV that is L stands for the left lung and pleura, AV for the azygos vein and V for the right vagus nerve. Finally, looking at the left relations, we have the word last R for the relations in the superior mediastinum as well as DLP for the relations in the posterior mediastinum. Now L stands for the left lung and pleura, A stands for the aortic arch, S stands for the left subclavian, T for the thoracic duct and R for the recurrent laryngeal nerve. For the relations in the posterior mediastinum, D stands for descending thoracic iota, L stands for the left lung and P stands for the mediastinal pleura. After having learned about the relations of the cervical part of the esophagus, the thoracic part of the esophagus, finally let us look at the relations about the abdominal part of the esophagus. Now firstly the abdominal part of the esophagus that you see right here is only 1.25 centimeters long. It enters the abdomen through the esophageal opening of the diaphragm situated at the level of T10 vertebra slightly, slightly to the left of the median plane. Now this esophageal opening also transmits the anterior and posterior gastric nerves, the esophageal branches of the left gastric artery and the accompanying veins. Now the esophagus runs downwards and to the left in front of the left crust of the diaphragm and of the inferior surface of the left lobe of the liver and ends by opening into the cardiac end of the stomach that you see right here at the level of T11 vertebrae that is the 11th thoracic vertebrae. Now peritoneum covers the esophagus only anteriorly and on the left side. So concising the important points under the relations of the esophagus, the relations of the cervical part of the esophagus, anteriorly we have the trachea and the right and left recurrent laryngeal nerves, posteriorly we have the longus coli muscle and the vertebral column, on each side we have the corresponding lobe of the thyroid gland and on the left side we have the thoracic duct. 
Moving on to the relations of the thoracic part of the esophagus, anteriorly we have the trachea, the right pulmonary artery, the left bronchus, the pericardium with the left atrium and the diaphragm. Posteriorly, there is a vertebral column, right posterior intercostal artery, the thoracic duct, the azygous vein, thoracic aorta, the right pleural recess and the diaphragm. Now, to the right, we have the right lung and pleura, the azygous vein and the right vagus. To the left, in the superior mediastinum, we have the aortic arch, the left subclavian, thoracic duct, left lung and pleura, left recurrent laryngeal nerve. And in the posterior mediastinum, we have the descending thoracic aorta, the left lung and the mediastinal pleura. Looking at the abdominal part of the esophagus, it is only 1.25 cm long. It enters the abdomen through the esophageal opening of the diaphragm, situated at the level of T10 vertebra, slightly to the left of the median plane. Now, this esophageal opening also transmits the anterior and posterior gastric nerves, the esophageal branches of the left gastric artery and the accompanying veins. The esophagus runs downwards and to the left in front of the left cross of the diaphragm and of the inferior surface of the left lobe of the liver and ends by opening into the cardiac end of the stomach at the level of the 11th thoracic vertebra. Finally, the peritoneum covers the esophagus only anteriorly and on the left side. Next, let's learn about the arterial supply of the esophagus. The cervical part of the esophagus, including the segment up to the arch of the iota, is supplied by the inferior thyroid artery that you see right here. The thoracic part is supplied by the esophageal branches of the aorta. The abdominal part is supplied by the esophageal branches of the left gastric artery that you see right here. Now looking at the venous drainage, blood from the upper part of the esophagus drains into the brachiocephalic veins that you see right here. From the middle part it drains into the azygous vein and from the lower end it goes into the left gastric veins that you see right here. Concising the important points under the arterial supply and the venous drainage, the cervical part including the segment up to the arch of the iota is supplied by the inferior thyroid arteries. The thoracic part is supplied by the esophageal branches of the aorta. The abdominal part is supplied by the esophageal branches of the left gastric artery. Looking at the venous drainage, the blood from the upper part of the esophagus drains into the brachiocephalic veins. From the middle part, it goes to the azygous vein. From the lower end, it goes into the left gastric vein. And the lower end of the esophagus is one of the sites of portosystemic anastomosis. Looking at the nerve supply of the esophagus, it is supplied by parasympathetic and sympathetic nerves. Now, in parasympathetic nerves, the upper half of the esophagus is supplied by the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Here you can see the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. Similarly, here you can see the right recurrent laryngeal nerve. And the lower half is supplied by the esophagus, esophageal plexus that you see right here. They are sensory, motor and secretomotor to the esophagus. Emphasizing the important points under the lymphatic drainage and nerve supply. The cervical part drains into the deep cervical nodes, the thoracic part into the posterior mediastinal nodes and the abdominal part into the left gastric nodes. Looking at the nerve supply, it is both by the parasympathetic and sympathetic nerves. In parasympathetic, the upper half of the esophagus is supplied by recurrent laryngeal nerves, the lower half is by the esophageal plexus. They are sensory, motor and secretomotor to the esophagus. Looking at the sympathetic nerves, for the upper half of the esophagus, fibers come from the middle cervical ganglia. For lower half, fibers come directly from the upper fold thoracic ganglia to form the esophageal plexus before supplying the esophagus. Now, these nerves are vasomotor. Now, let's learn about the histology of the esophagus. The epithelium is stratified squamous non-keratinized in character and protective in function. The muscularis mucosae that you see right here is indistinct at the beginning of the esophagus but becomes distinct lower down. Now the submucosa contains esophageal glands. These are mucus secreting glands with acini which are round or oval in shape. Now the muscularis externa right here has striated muscle fibers in the upper third, mixed striated and smooth muscle fibers in the middle third and smooth muscle fibers in the lower third of the esophagus. The outermost layer is the adventitia which is made up of loose connective tissue with capillaries and nerves.
Now, concising the important points under the histology of the esophagus, the mucous membrane is torn into longitudinal folds when empty. The epithelium is stratified squamous, non-keratinized in character and protective in function. The muscularis mucosae is indistinct at the beginning of the esophagus but becomes distinct lower down. The submucosa contains esophageal glands. These are mucus secreting glands with acini which are round or oval in shape. Finally, the muscularis externa has striated muscle fibers in the upper third, mixed that is striated and smooth muscle fibers in the middle third and smooth muscle fibers alone in the lower third of the esophagus. Finally, let's look at the clinical anatomy of the esophagus. First, let's look at the condition called achalasia cardia. The lower end of the esophagus is normally kept closed. It is opened by the stimulus of a foot bolus. Now, in case of a neuromuscular incoordination, the lower end of the esophagus fails to dilate with arrival of food, which accumulates in the esophagus. This condition of neuromuscular incoordination is called achalasia cardia. Secondly, there is tracheoesophageal fistula, that is, improper separation of trachea from the esophagus, as you can see right here. In portal hypertension, Communications between the portal and systemic veins draining the lower end of the esophagus dilate. Here you can see the dilated veins. Now these dilatations are called esophageal varices. Concising the important points under the clinical anatomy of the esophagus. First is the calasia cardia. The lower end of the esophagus is normally kept closed. It is opened by the stimulus of a foot bolus. In case of neuromuscular incoordination, the lower end of the esophagus fails to dilate with the arrival of food which accumulates in the esophagus. This condition of neuromuscular incoordination is known as achalasia cardia. Second is tracheoesophageal fistula that is improper separation of the trachea from the esophagus. Finally, there is esophageal varices. In portal hypertension, communications between the portal and systemic veins draining the lower end of the esophagus dilate and this is called esophageal varices. I hope you found this video helpful. To get the notes of esophagus as well as other notes of anatomy, physiology, biomechanics and other health science subjects, visit my Instagram page, the link to which is given in the description below. To get updates on my latest videos, click on the subscribe button. To get notifications, tap on the bell icon. Thank you for watching.